J. Richard Greenwell was a renowned cryptozoologist and explorer, but he was also a skeptic. During his lifetime he participated in many expeditions to look for mysterious creatures or cryptids. Greenwell became the secretary of the International Society of Cryptozoology from its inception to his death and participated in many expeditions across the world, searching for elusive creatures such as Bigfoot, the Anza, and Mokombembi. He also journeyed to China along with the anthropologist Frank Poirier to try to discover the Yeren, a Chinese version of the Bigfoot. All of the expeditions, while unsuccessful, helped to keep awareness of mysterious creatures alive. Greenwell participated on his last expedition in August 2005 searching for scientific proof of Bigfoot in the North Californian wilderness, even though he was in the last stages of cancer. What you are about to hear is an interview between Greenwell and Bob Gimlin. This interview was conducted just two years before the cryptozoologist's death. Greenwell, and today is uh, August, August 14. 2003. Three. Amazing, isn't it? 2003. And uh, um, I'm here uh, with uh, Bob Gimlin at his home in Yakima, and we're doing a little social call and chatting and, and ask a few questions about what happened that day and the aftermath of 1967. I'd also like to cover the, the BBC debacle in a few minutes. Um, so I know you tell this story so many times you're probably sick of telling it but you and uh, as briefly as you can you, you and Roger were doing what? Why were you out there? reason we were in Northern California is uh, prior to the time that we were in Northern California we were over around the Mount St. Helens area just investigating for footprints or whatever we might run into and when we it started raining really heavy over there around the Mount St. Helens, so everything we had was wet. We had the horses with us, and uh, and I had my truck, but the canvas on the top had got some holes ripped in it from going underneath the trees. So everything, our bed rolls were wet, and so we came back to Yakima. Returning to Yakima. Roger uh, found out that uh, some people from Northern California had called his wife and said that they, had, uh, that they were building some roads back into the mountains uh, by Bluff Creek and uh, they had, they had uh, stationary a uh, fuel tank back there to fuel the cats and the, and the equipment they were building the road. And this was on like September uh, or the last day of August or, the, or might have been the first of September. I can't. Re I don't remember the exact dates, but what was happening? They put this tank in there, uh, this big fuel truck, uh, and uh, and uh, over Labor Day weekend when they weren't working, they came back on Tuesday morning after the Monday of Labor Day and found all these tracks around this tank that they put in there. Now, so, wasn't that also happening in 1958? when they first were building those logging roads into there? That's what Roger told me. I didn't know yeah. this. So I, this is something similar to the 58. Same, something similar yeah. to what Roger had told me had happened in 58. So you guys decided to head on down there? Well, not really. Not, I didn't decide right away because I, of course, I had quite a few horses and I had cattle and everything then. And so Roger said, well, can, can we take your rig and go and I said well I, I don't know I'm gonna have to get some arrangements made here to do my chores and also I was working uh, I had a full-time job uh, I was roofing at that time and working construction and roofing and I said I'm gonna have to find out just exactly what is lined up for the next few days because I thought we were only going to be gone down there a week uh, Roger said well we'll run down take a look see what happened and uh, then we can get back. Well, because uh, it was my truck, so I had uh, control over what we were going to do. But anyway, so I got a guy to take care of my cattle and my horses and stuff because my wife worked and she didn't have time to do all of this. And I had hay fields and things that had to be taken care of, irrigated. So I got a guy or a couple of guys to do my chores, and and uh, we loaded up our my my horse and. Uh, or a horse I had leased from a guy, a big old roping horse, and Roger his two small horses. And we headed down into Northern California. Well, not knowing that it had rained all up and down the West Coast uh, at that time, when we got down there, these tracks that 
supposedly were good prints of three different ver uh, sizes uh, had been washed just almost that I couldn't tell I couldn't identify a track of, it was they were just kind of places where water had stood in the in the dirt and the mud in this fresh dirt so I wasn't I was a, a non-believer except the fact that Roger would play these tapes and different things and and I'm kind of a believer in and if I don't see it I don't hundred percent believe it and I thought there probably is something out there but until I see a real I hadn't seen a good footprint even up to that time and I didn't see a good one down there so I wasn't convinced but, but did you decide to stay there a while and look around well, well yeah we decided uh, we talked it over and said I figured uh, as long as we were down there on the trip we'd stay that week and we had our horses of course so we could ride and cover quite a bit of area and we rode and rode and rode and um, mainly, uh, mainly around Bluff Creek all around Bluff Creek and up where they was trying to build roads way up above what called Onion Mountain there we were working and, and what we do is uh, when the when the equipment would get off those would-be roads I'd take my little truck and I'd drive real slow up those dirt where well, you couldn't go fast anyway because it was just dirt it was just mm. and you'd sink down you know and so we'd look for tracks to cross the road at in the, at night just drive slow and Roger would take a fly slide or whatever and or a big spotlight and we'd look along the side of the road and so this wasn't just a, a, a horse thing it was a you were also using vehicles then. yeah we were using my tr my truck yeah. at, at night after the cat after the equipment yeah. got off the roads because <laughs> the narrow roads you couldn't right. drive there with the equipment working and so we'd go at night and then we'd ride in the daytime uh, uh, through the mountains and around that area and so uh, uh, Time kind of started overlaps, and I said, "I got to get back. I got to get back up there to my job." So we were in there from, uh, we were in there from uh, uh, the middle. Well, by the time we got down there, it was late later in September. You know, I think it was two or three weeks. So it was getting close to October. So you were there about three weeks. We were there around three weeks. I think maybe even a little longer because it was in. It was uh, in the middle of October when actually we actually saw this creature, and we'd been we ridden all we'd ridden in this same area prior to the time that we saw this, and it and uh, Roger said, well let you know let's ride cover that area again and we'll stay maybe take the the pack horse and take our stuff and we'll maybe stay if you want we'll stay all night up there. Well, it was warm for October. It was like it was fall days, but it was nice and warm and sunny days and fairly warm nights. Well, I was used to sleeping out anyway. It didn't bother me to sleep out underneath the tree. I was pretty young then, and Roger, you know, he he was pretty tough when it come to that. He'd sleep out, so that's what we were actually going to do that particular day that we got this these film this film, and uh, we were riding up that bluff creek the creek bottom of the creek and on now, the now the exact location I've been there twice I think is where the creek is suddenly turns and goes directly north fairly straight in that area and then it turns east and goes east a long way for miles yeah but it was in in that northern what was it in that northern direct north area about yeah half a mile maybe I think yeah it was about in there Richard it uh, it, it's it's a straight line, which is strange for Bluff Creek. It usually yeah. meanders around a lot. Right, right. But it was that straight it north. Was, yeah, area. it was. Yeah. That, yeah, it was that area. I've been there twice. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. all different from when you were there. Now. Yeah. Oh, I know. Oh, it would be, yeah. yeah it's be. Uh, that that sand's gone, and the, well, see, it, it's all grown up. There's trees and everything. The water would probably. I heard that the reason that sandbar kind of was there, and uh, kind of like a log jam. Earlier in '73, I think it was, they had a lot of yeah. rain and floods, flood. and they jammed up. That jammed up, and mm -hmm. so the soil backed up and kind of made a that that flat area is still there, where it's all grass and bushes and trees. Oh, is and that right? Yeah. There was pretty good flat area, but there's like cliffs on a, one side and another little creek coming in from another direction there up above it. Yeah. Well, on so the, what happened? Well, we were camped about oh about three miles down. Uh, from where the film was actually filmed 
and uh, on the way up there of course the maple trees and things were turning red from fall colors and Roger was taking pictures of the because we had no idea you know we'd been looking and looking and hadn't seen a footprint or nothing uh, you know a fresh anything fresh from what they had told us about up at that uh, at the, that fuel truck or fuel uh, tank and so he was taking pictures of me riding the horse and leading the pack horse and and uh, of the the scenery actually just the scenery and so when uh, we come around there's a bend in the creek there and there was a big uh, roots and stuff of a tree that had been washed over and it was pretty high and the creek had rerouted itself around this that I call it a downfall tree and when we came around that big uh, tree there uh, the, we just made the bend and come around and, and this creature was standing upright right at the edge of the creek on the fore side of the creek from the side we were on. Facing you or sideways? It was facing or kind of well it was actually facing the creek and as we came around of course it looked at us but it wasn't bending down or drinking or you didn't see anything like that. no I didn't see anything like that right. if it was bending down and drinking Roger was ahead of me on his horse and I was probably maybe I'd say two horse lengths I'd be about 15 feet behind Roger just riding along kind of casual not even you know not really yeah. looking for anything and uh, when I saw the creature it was standing up did he see it first uh, before you then? well I he probably did yeah I we never did even discuss that he probably did see it before me but the horses was blow you know his horse was kind of a little spooky horse anywhere I don't know if he was spooky but he was just throwing a real fit and uh, he was rearing up and, and jer jumping around well my horse was an old rope horse well he wasn't being real nice about everything either you know he was kind of spooked too did you guys say anything to each other oh my god look at that or did, did well you, did you uh, not, uh, this all happened in seconds right not not time to mu much there wasn't any conversation at, at that particular time because roger was trying to manage his horse and he had this camera in his saddlebag so he was working that horse and kind of reared up and fell over oh and, it did fall over well it kind of reared up and went over uh, not all not down all the way as best I could see I wasn't really watching Roger uh, you know you can see a certain amount out of the corner of your eyes but I was trying to manage my horse the pack horse jerked free for me and yeah. took off back the other way yeah. well I was trying to manage my horse and kind of see what was this was all about you know what the what was happening and the creature just turned and started walking away now how far away do you think it was when you guys first noticed it it was probably uh, just uh, you know I I've, I've been asked that a, do a lot sure. of different times and and I really couldn't tell you in feet except thinking about it back and forth over the years you know I think it was probably about 60 feet or maybe a, a, maybe a little farther from where I was at the time the horses kind of went back you know and uh, round yeah. and jump, jumped around there did, uh, were the horses reacting to it do you think oh yeah did, yeah they, they were they, scared of it they'd seen it and they didn't know what it was they didn't know what it was and the horses were scared so what happened then and so then Roger got the camera out and uh, then he then he did say cover me which I, we both had rifles in our saddle back on our, on our saddles tight on our saddles I had a 30 odd six and I, I'm not sure what Roger had he had a rifle of some kind there uh, anyway so Roger ran across the creek the creek was only foot and a half maybe two mm -hmm. foot deep at the very most and he and this was kind of a sloping sand bar coming down to the creek probably sloped up about three or four maybe uh, four feet at the most from the creek edge up to the crest and Roger ran across that and then there was a log down log there and he stabilized himself on that log to start well he was trying to get pictures I guess I don't know he th it tells me this later and you can see in the film where it's all yeah it jumps jumbled, and he's trying to trying to look and see while he's running 
while he's running across the creek and then up this sandbar a little ways. He went up the sandbar, oh, I think probably 15, 20, 25 feet uh, before he got down on this log and started, uh, you know, stabilizing himself. And in the meantime, the, 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 the animal would had turned and was moving away. Was walking away. The, the, like you see in the film. Right. And then, so then I rode across, I stayed on my horse and I rode across the creek and that's when sometime in this event he said take he didn't I knew what he meant when he said cover me that right. meant take the right. rifle and then in case right. the thing turned and came after him because he was afoot his horse was gone you know down run back down right. towards the pack horse so anyway I I rode across the creek and I knew uh, in the film you can see the creature turn and look and that's when I rode across, it turned and looked at me, but it kept right on walk. I mean, it turned its head and its body kind of as it was striking. Oh, was it looking at you? It was looking in that famous sequence that's right. where, where it turns. It's looking at you. Right. It was looking at me because I rode across the creek, and I knew I couldn't fire a good shot, an accurate shot, if the horse was jumping. So I stepped down off the horse and took the rifle out of the out of the saddle scabbard and stood there with I never did raise the rifle uh. or aim it at the creature or nothing I just stood there with a rifle in my hand hanging onto my horse because he was still a jerking and jumping around so I figured if I had to I could let the horse go and if I had to make a fatal shot if I was forced to do that which I didn't want to do you know because I didn't really know nothing about what right. these things were or what right. never seen anything like that didn't even really believe in them until that those few split seconds there. And so that's when uh, uh, then uh, the thing moved off, uh, taking pretty good strides but not running. It just walked out pretty briskly. And then Roger moved again because it was going through some kind of trees and, and stumps of downfalls yeah. and stuff and around some things. And then Roger moved again to get a better view. And uh, then then the thing went up around uh the creature went up around and kind of disappeared in uh, mm -hmm. a, around the bend where the creek went and so i said well i'm gonna then i was going to get back on the horse and ride after it i don't even know why just i wanted to see it more or so roger said no hey hey don't he said i ran out of film in the camera he said help me catch up my horse and uh and we'll and I'll put some more film in the camera. He said, and then help me catch up my horse. Well, he got underneath a, a poncho thing that I had on the back of my saddle, and uh, got underneath there to change film or whatever he had to do. I didn't know much about this camera thing, and so I was trying to catch the horses up in the meantime. And when he got the film in, I couldn't catch them because they would run this way and run that way. And, and uh, they were pretty badly spooked. And they was just running up and down the creek and kind of up in the brush. So finally, Roger got the film in the camera, and he come and helped me, and we caught up the horses. Well, this this took a few minutes to do this, uh, get this all done. So then we wanted to go ahead and follow where it went, and try and get some more pictures. And then it had gone into the tree line, I think, behind the tree line. Right? It had gone up the the other branch of the creek. And, and and by then it got out of the soil and it was into gravelly bed of the creek. And the only way we could determine the stride of what it was doing then was where the gravels were turned up. And then we rode up that creek bed probably, oh, I think less than a half a mile. And we found a part of where it had walked across the creek. The creek was, at that place, was probably seven, eight foot across, but shallow, but it had some big rocks and we found one partial of a print of wet print on a rock and then it went right on up into the mountains into the cliffs and up into the trees but it didn't in the film towards the end it looks like it's heading towards this tree line it didn't go in there though? didn't go into that tree line that you see oh, in the film it stayed in the open for a while no, it wasn't in the open. It was right up the creek bottom. Well, in the open, there, there were no trees, I mean. Well, there were Didn't trees down fairly close. There yeah. was trees within 12, 14 feet of the creek. 
but it never went into those trees. It stayed in the open. Stayed in, on the creek bottom. Okay, I stayed see. on the creek bottom, mm -hmm. and we seen these scuffs in the gravel, but then we seen that partial footprint, wet print on a rock, a great big rock there that it had stepped on to go across. Apparently. See, a lot of people, including myself, assumed in looking at the film that it went into those trees and was gone. No. I didn't realize it stayed in the creek bed and the for creek so bed. long. Yeah, out of our sight. See, there's a hill that kind of, kind of come down to the, mm -hmm. and then the creek makes a turn there, and this was out of our sight all the time it was going up this creek bed. I see. We didn't, uh, when we last saw it was just about the time that you see the end of the film. Mm -hmm. And maybe I might have seen it another second or two or three or yeah. after that. Uh, because when he hollered, I'm out of film, I can't remember just exactly where the sequence was where the creature was when he said he was out of film. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, Roger, to my knowledge, and I'm trying to remember for sure whether he filmed that footprint that on the rock or not. Or, but anyway, it was getting a little later. You know, the sun goes down pretty early in October, uh, in the middle of October. So uh, he said, well, we better uh, go back. I said, well, what do you think? He said, well, I don't, we can't, we're not going to be able to follow it up to them cliffs and up to the mountains anyway. And uh, I said, well, if we leave the pack horse and go afoot, and he said, I'm not going to go afoot. I'm not going to go up in there. And I said, well, even if we took our rifles, would you go? And he said, I could, you know, I don't want to carry the rifle. It says it's too steep to carry the camera and the rifle. The camera is a pretty good size. Yeah, that's pretty rough country. Yeah. It was rough country. So we went back. Uh, we went back to our camp, and he got plaster of Paris to make some uh, uh, prints. Is, is that now when you say back to your camp, you mean three miles down? Road back, yeah, road back. Is that near Laos camp, maybe, where your camp was? You know, remember Laos camp? Uh, it There's might a little have. bridge there. The bridge there? No, there was no bridge where we were at because right, okay. I had to drive across the creek. Oh, okay. I have to drive across the creek with my truck. It, it was it was an old log landing, is what it was, or kind of where they loaded out logs or something, because there was a quite a space in there where we parked and and there was lots of wood for us to burn and there was a place where I made a hitch and rail for the horses. But anyway, we went back and we got the plaster of Paris. We went back up and Roger mixed this all up and put it in these tracks. And oh, and he said, well, you know, he said, we got to get this done, and then, uh, and then we're gonna, we we'll go back to, back down to the camp and get in the truck and take the film to Eureka, I think. Why Eureka? Eureka. Eureka. Yeah. Well, first through Orleans and then Eureka. Then we and Willow went, Creek. We went to Willow Creek and he talked to Mr. Hodson. Hang on a sec. How many tracks do you think there were visible before you started putting the plaster? Oh, there was. Uh, well, I kind of go back a little ways, too. I took my big horse, which uh, weighed around 1,200 pounds, and uh, Roger said, Can you do this while I take these pictures? Ride alongside with that horse alongside these tracks. There was a lot of tracks there. You mean dozens? Oh yeah, yeah, dozens of tracks were yeah. good, plain, good, yeah. identical tracks. Anyway, uh, so I rode this big horse along there to show the difference in the print. And this horse with the four feet with shoes on wasn't making the print as deep as this creature made it in the same soil. So Roger said, uh, well, I was wearing cowboy boots, high heel cowboy boots. He said, get up on that, that stump, which was probably 36 inches high, uh, a broke off stump there, and then jump off into that dirt with your foot and make a print. So I did that to make the print to, to uh, illustrate the difference in the track and the depth of my boot. One foot or two at the same time? I think I jumped with both feet. I can't yeah. remember. I seen the film and then I forgot whether and, it was. And how many? How deep was that? Then? It was. It. It's still. I only weighed about 170 pounds in, and uh, it still did not go quite as deep as the footprint went. 
So oh, I thought, and uh, and you know, there was no way of knowing what this thing could weigh or anything, because it 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 was right. bulky, had tremendous bulk in the, in the arms and legs, which you can see in the film. Yeah. And uh, how many tracks? How many casts? Did, did, did he make of the tracks? How many? Uh, I think he made uh, four. four. I know he made one of each side. He only had so much plaster. Yeah, what, whatever plaster he had and mixed up in a in a. Well, he had a, a plastic gallon yeah. jug. So jug. He made about four of them. I think he made four tracks, the best I can remember. And uh, now, isn't that a film? Where when he changed films, maybe where you guys filmed the tracks and the plaster in the tracks. Or? Yeah, yeah. There was yeah. a film at one time. I don't know whatever happened. I've heard that that sort of disappeared, disappeared somewhere, or lost or something. Yeah. Well, somewhere it went because there's been. They've asked me about that a lot of times, yeah. and I don't know where that it went. It still hasn't turned out because I, Roger and Al did all these they things took it yeah. away afterwards, you know. And so uh, after we got to, and it took a little while for that plaster to set up enough for us to pick it up, and move it. Yeah. So by then it was getting, it was getting dark. Uh, by the time we went back to the camp, back to where the truck was, it was getting dark. And Roger said, "Well," and we were quite a ways back in the hills, you know. Oh yeah. So he said, "Well, let's drive in to uh, Bluff Creek." And tell Mr. Will Willow Creek, Willow Creek, yeah. Willow Creek, and tell Mr. Hodson uh, what what happened, and uh, so I said okay, and so we did, and and uh, while we were there, uh, it was a moonlight night, nice moonlight night. Then we went on over to to mail that film. Understood, Roger was going to air mail the film to his brother-in-law, which is Aldi Atley in. Yakima. I think he was going to do it to Yak in Yakima, or maybe he call was going to call Al and have him pick it up in Seattle or wherever. I don't remember this because yeah. you know it was pretty exciting. Things was happening all at once, and something that I didn't even really real uh, realize could happen. So uh, I and I didn't go in with Roger to do these different things. Yeah. I was in the I stayed in the truck. Yeah. So when we get back to uh, Willow Creek. I, t I asked uh, Roger, I said, you know, I'll get some cardboard boxes and stuff from from that store, that variety store in the back there where I had them, and I'll cover some of them tracks up because Roger had called some people in Canada that had track dogs, and I can't remember the guy's name now, but he was going to bring the track dogs down and start where we last seen this thing and try to track it up through the mountains there. And uh, so we went back. Of course, we were pretty excited about everything. A big old full moon out there and beautiful. And and we we bedded down. It must have been 12 o'clock or so. You we went all the way back to the site. We went right back to where we had parked our truck before. Well, the horses were there. Oh, yeah. So right, we had right. to go back. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. didn't have to, but that's where our camp was. So we went back. And about three in the morning, I sleep real light anyway, I could hear this rain on the truck, hear it start raining. So I I tried to wake Roger up, I got down off my, I was sleeping up in the over rack and he was sleeping down in the in the truck, down in the truck itself. And I tried to wake Roger up and he said, what's wrong? And I said, well, it's raining. And he said, oh, it ain't, it ain't gonna rain, it won't rain very long. And I said, I said so I got, I climbed back up in my bunk and and the overshot over there, and I'm pretty sure it started to just kept on and it's coming down. So I got down out of there again. I said, Roger, it's raining harder. So I went down, and what I had done that night is when I got there, I took all these cardboard boxes out and threw them out and by the side of the truck, not even thinking about rain. And so I get up and get out there. I thought, I got to get them cardboard boxes out of the rain, or you know. So I got there, and they were just soaked already soaked. Yeah. So I thought, well, they're going to be useless. I'm not going to carry them on a horse up to that three miles filmed where the film was. So I didn't sleep anymore and Roger, of course, he was snoring away and and when it got about daylight, I said, well, I'm going to go back up there and figure out some way to cover up some of them tracks, you know, so that people can see them because I already remembered 
these washing out on that hillside where the fuel tank was. I thought, you know, if you don't have a track, I'd never seen a track until that day, and I didn't really believe. I believed, but yet there was skeptic in my mind. And so I went up there, and and I looked around, and I seen these dead trees with bark hanging on them. So I started ripping these big chunks of bark off, covering these tracks up the best I could because it wasn't raining hard enough yet then to wash those tracks out. And uh, we, I figured if they, the next morning if they got there from Canada with the track dogs that, you know, maybe the, the, the tracks would help. If they, I didn't know what the track dogs consisted of, whether they were hounds or what yeah. they were. Uh, come to find out they were German Shepherds. But mm. So anyway, uh, I did the best I could to cover them up. Well, by the time I got back down, it was like, you know, about 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. Well, that creek had started from that rain, that creek that I drove my truck across, which was about 2 foot deep, was by then 3 foot deep. And I looked at that creek and I told Roger, I said, hey, if I'm going to get my truck on the other side of that creek, if we're going to leave here because if that creek comes up I'm never going to get this truck because it wasn't four wheel drive and so I got the truck all uh, lined up and, and I made a run at this creek and I got across on the other side and uh, then uh, Roger said well he said we might as well pack up uh, get our horses loaded and go and I said yeah because this rain it was coming down something fierce and it was kind of cold uh, and so we started the down the low road and we got a little ways down there and there was a mudslide coming down the hill and the trees was sliding down too and uh, I said well I don't know what we're going to do here you know uh, so I thought well I seen this mudslide and I thought well I'll see how deep it is maybe I can run through it because there was some pretty good sized rocks in it but I thought I could run through it and this creek was just wild by then it was coming down over there and it was dropping off about eight foot into another area and uh, I walked out in it well immediately it was knee deep or oh, right at the very edge of this mudslide at the road was knee deep and I knew I couldn't get through with a truck so I said to Roger I got to get this truck turned around you watch for me because it was raining so the windshield wipers couldn't even keep it off the, there and so I was trying to look in my mirrors to watch Roger motioned me back and he almost caused me to back in over the creek over the bank in the creek because he was watching the trees sliding down the hill towards us and he started hollering hey there's a tree coming down and it was probably another hundred feet from us but it was just sliding slowly down the mud slides was bringing it right on down so we started out over the top of the mountain and I got there a little ways and the truck wouldn't pull it was just sliding wasn't going at all and here I had these trucks horses in there and the tailgate that slid open slid right down up against a tree there was no way to unload the horses out of the truck no way and I had remembered to see in a backhoe uh, up way up on the mountain up way up on top where they were working these roads so I thought my only hope to get this truck out of here is to go get that backhoe so I ran, ran up the mountain and threw a bunch of big boulders in the bucket of this backhoe and got it started up and this is probably almost a quarter of a mile so you borrowed it yeah there was I, no one there I had no I had no options yeah there was no one there I mean oh no there was no one there was there a key there to start it yeah there was a key in it oh, wow. and I just of course I run equipment before and I yeah. started it up and I come down and of course it was raining so dad gum hard you couldn't it just I was soaked to the bone in a, just minutes but as long as I was running and I was warm I was okay I'm surprised you made it up in the mud though. well you know this this backhoe you can do pretty good with it no back. going up by foot I mean oh well hey up, I was young and I was stout <laughs> then you know and, and, and I you know I was in great shape physical shape I was great physical shape but uh, and I got hooked onto the truck and I told Roger, I said, and by then I was starting to get cold because I didn't have heavy coats on, clothes on, and I was starting to really, really get cold. But I knew I couldn't stop because I told Roger, I said, you keep the truck in, in low gear and keep it going, and I'll keep pulling you because I said, I don't think this backhoe is going to 
alone is going to pull up that mountain. Well, this was a dual wheel one ton truck. Dual wheels don't do good in the mud or snow. So we got to the top of the mountain. The time we got to the top of the mountain, hypothermia had started in on me, and I was I was I was in I was had convulsions and I was just I was shaking so bad and I couldn't even hardly get down off the backhoe. Well, Roger could see I was in bad shape. So I knew that we had to keep moving because of the rain and the mud. So I get in the, he had the heater running in the truck. And uh, when we got in the truck, well, he had a lemon cut open and I took the juice out of that lemon and I jerked my, my shirt off, the wet shirt, and just put a coat around me. And I got behind the steering wheel and with the, adrenaline pumping and that lemon and the heat of the truck then I started on out over the mountain and was right on the top and the truck wasn't pulling worth a darn the, the transmission was it was a man, manual transmission the transmission was heating up I could feel it on, with my foot and uh, I told Roger I said I've got a flat tire step out on the edge of that running board and look back there and tell me why I can't seem to go very fast and Roger stepped out on the edge of the on the running board and looked around the van. It had a horse van on it. And he got back in and he was just ghostly white. He said, don't even slow down. He said, the whole mountain sliding away as you're pulling with that dual wheel on the very edge of that road. Well, naturally, uh, that was pretty dead gum stressful for me. So it took us all, almost all day to get out of that, what, 25 or 30 miles was back at that camp when we started out about 8 30 that morning it was in the afternoon time we got down to the highway to start out the time to Orle near Orleans right to get started out so then I went on out and uh, and I hadn't ate anything except breakfast that morning and so I drove uh, I said well if we'll we would drive on straight on home and see what because Roger said I don't even think by running and falling down over that to stabilize himself he said I'm not sure I even got any picture at all so there was a question in both yeah. of our minds whether there was any film footage to have any view of right. any anything yeah. and uh, so we, I said well, well we'll head to Yakima and see what Al the Atlee got what, what, what it was and Roger said, well, yeah, he said, I'll help you drive. And so I, and Roger went to sleep while I was driving, and I stopped a couple of times to get fuel, to fill my truck up, and he never did wake up. And then I got, uh, while I was getting fuel, I'd get buckets of water and give the horses. And I had hay in the truck, so I'd give them hay and water. And I drove straight through here to Yakima. And then and you crashed, and, and I was I was really beat from the excitement and from all of the, you know, all of the stress of getting that truck out of there and everything. You slept what for a day or something? Oh yeah, I slept after. through. I can't remember whether it was the next morning that we got in here, because by then everything was almost just a blur to me. Yeah. I was just kind of walk, and so I just went to bed and I slept and and. Uh, uh, Roger had called and in the meantime the guys come down with the dogs but they flew in there on a little plane from Canada and unloaded and they couldn't go back because of these mudslides they couldn't get back there until a couple of days after that until they could move the mudslides out now when you saw this thing then did you say to yourself something like oh my god it really does exist you know did, did the reality of it hit you well How did you feel about yeah it? it did on but at that time there was such a it was such a shock and such a uh, tremendous uh, everything happened so fast just right it, I don't think hardly anybody can realize how quick all these things well happen. the film lasts only 50 something seconds yeah, no, not very long. Just so, a minute. But okay, maybe not right then, but soon afterwards. Oh, well, did it yeah, begin to sink then soon in? My afterwards. God, this is this is real. Right. I thought all of this time I've kind of wondered if they really did exist. Uh, and you had no doubt then. Oh, definitely. Then you know, I seen this creature standing there and then turn and walk away and a stride. To, Describe it uh, briefly. It just it was uh, uh, well the way I've always said I'm a horse person and. A, a huge muscle quarter horse moving like that. This thing had so much muscle, so much bulk in it, 
that it just moved like a great big powerful. Could you see the muscles moving? Yeah, you as can as see it yeah, the, the thighs and the and the arms as it swing its arm back and forward. You could see the difference in the, the bulk of the muscle. And that's what, uh, after I thought about that, even with the hair, it had hair on it, uh, I realized that this thing was, was a very powerful creature. And yeah, on the way home, even though I was tired, I kept kind of going through my mind what tried to, what happened so quickly that you kind of, and then I was tired and then until I saw the film again, a lot of things that went kind of blank in my mind. But when you saw the film, what you saw on the film was the same as what you saw. It was the same as what I saw. Uh, and what, what was your feeling as to height and weight? Sorry. Well, now there was a lot of... Uh, uh, they, they said, well, what do you think of height? And I said, well, you know, something with that much bulk didn't seem to be as high, as tall as it really was. And they said, well, what do you think it weighed? I said, well, I always thought, you know, 350 pound man was a big, big man. And I said, oh, probably 350 pounds with all that bulk. Well, uh, I guess I was probably way off. The thing probably weighed 800 pounds or 700, because they had been estimations be after that with the footprint and so forth that it was probably up around that. And the height? And what the did you height? feel? Well, see, I never. They said height. I said, well, I don't know, six foot or so, or maybe better, which proved out to be almost seven feet. Six seven or something. Six. Like that. Yeah, up there, pretty high, and that's taking a foot scale and then measuring up the body, right. and it was walking, you know, too. Right. So, and, and I don't. But you know, not this thing. Like I say, happened so rapidly that those things you don't think about until later. Of, of weight and height and uh, when? and uh, a, a lot of things like they said well did you see this did you see that did you see that well, okay did you see the breasts yes I saw well I saw something you know that that appeared to be breasts something yes I saw mm -hmm. and I, I I could never swear on my Bible here that, that no, I, was, I don't want to get you know too uh, detailed but when women walk and they're bare-breasted, you know, there's a certain floppiness about the breast. Did, did they seem to be straight, or, or did you notice an undulating movement? Under, I they, noticed the movement you're talking about, like a woman's movement. The breasts, the, 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 they, they, were, they were moving right. as she walked. They were moving. And if she'd stopped still, you felt they would probably stop moving. Yeah, if she stopped. She didn't. Stop never did right, stand right. still. Say. But, but they seemed like living tissue, not, not some stiff thing that had been that's what I thought glued on it appeared something. to me yeah. like they were living tissue they saw so movement just like you saw movement with the muscles right right and uh, of course a, a, a number uh, quite a bit of the time other than when she turned to look at me I never I didn't see the front part right I saw the front part when she's standing and then everything went kind of wild and then when she turned and walked away her back was to me, and then when I rode across the creek, and she turned and turned partially, didn't turn all the way, just enough that you could see, you could see some that movement, and that's all I ever seen of the breast because the rest of the time the back was to me. All right. What's the closest you ever got then with all this? What was going Pro on? Uh, probably the closest I ever got was uh, the closest I ever saw it was when we. The cross the creek when she's standing. Oh, right at the beginning. Right at the beginning. And what's the closest pa uh, um, uh, Roger that you got to it? Because he ran up. Well, he that. changed positions right. twice, and he was uh, uh, the first with the sandbar thing. I think he probably was about, well, I would imagine, 90, 80, 90 feet away from it. And then when he repositioned himself, he was probably. 100, 200 feet maybe away. So 80 or 90 was the closest. Uh, probably, yeah, yeah uh, because I wasn't really watching Roger. Right, you were watching. Watching and that, and the creature. And the thing yeah. never seemed to really change its pace very much. Uh -uh. It didn't get into a trot, or it just kept... Didn't even act like it was afraid of us, it just yeah. was going to leave. That's uh, typical of what other people have reported. And with me riding that big horse across the creek and getting off, 
uh, I think if it would have had fear of us, it would have then changed its stride. Can I ask you, in the few minutes we have left, about the BBC mess? The BBC uh, Wildlife Unit in Bristol uh, was dealing with me to do this documentary. They didn't deal with me in the end. They took a lot of information, though. And they called you and interviewed you over the phone, as I recall. Yeah, right. right. And there was a, a guy called Appleby, Paul Appleby. He called you. Yeah. And uh, they then used that interview to make certain allegations in the documentary and also in a magazine article, in BBC Wildlife magazine. Could you just sort of recount briefly your recollection of, of how all that happened? Well, I, I don't, uh, Richard, really, I, but they told me, they lied to me. That's what I want to know. What, what do you remember? They told me the that that was for just their own personal information. It would never be used for anything else. What did they ask you about the event, and what did you answer? Hey, that, that's, that's important. Uh, about the same thing I just got through telling you. They, mm -hmm. they asked me... The best I can remember, they just asked me the sequences of the of the shooting of the film, mm -hmm. which was just the same as I gave you. And uh, other than that, I don't remember the the exact things that they asked me. It was on the telephone. I had things pending that I was trying to get get them get through with it and get going. You know. Well, in the article that came out, and I think I sent you a copy. You probably did. And, and I, I wrote a 17-page rebuttal to that article, which I also sent you. Um, they stated in that article um, that you finally conceded to them, I think under intense questioning, okay. they, they claimed that you finally conceded that Roger could have done a hoax on you. Well, you know, they. I want to know about that. They they kept badgering me, and I said, I don't think. Well, what exactly? Well, how were they badgering you? What were they saying? What were they asking? I they I think they asked me, uh, do you think that Roger could have planted someone there in a suit? I can't remember the exact thing they asked yeah. me, and I said, you know, I don't think way back there how Roger could have ever deceived me, and. Uh, and only the, and they asked me about the shooting thing. Why didn't you shoot it? I think I can't remember what all they asked me. Or why didn't you uh, uh, raise your gun and draw, uh, uh, you know, aim at it? And I said, well, Roger and I had talked many times about if you ever did see one of these things, don't be shooting it because you're going to run into problems with uh, different societies, religious people, and if this proven humanoid, then you're going to be facing a criminal charge. Well, you realize if if you had shot it, it would have all been over. <laughs> this, this is true, too. That's what, but but uh, that's a different issue. Yeah, that, that's what uh, Grover but, used to say. But, but what I'm trying to get at now is you you told them that you really didn't think that, that, that Roger could have done a hoax. Right. But do I, uh, do I have it correct? I want to make sure that I've interpreted this right. That after you said that, they persisted with that line of question. They did, yeah. Repeatedly. Repeatedly. And you kept repeating, no, I don't think that. Right. Is that true? That's true. I said, you know, I'd be pretty hard to be deceived on something like that. Now, did there or did there not come a point, because I have read finally what they quoted you saying, did you finally concede, perhaps under this pressure, they had you stating something like, like, well, you know, it, I guess I suppose it's possible, it's conceivable. I, I don't think it could have happened, but but it it it, it it's not impossible. Did you, you know, say something? Like I think that? I did, uh, Richard. I think I said, well, hey, anything, anything's possible. anything's possible. If you're pressured enough, you know, I said any. I think I don't remember the exact. That's word, what's in print. But I said. Uh, that's what's in print, and they use that then yeah. to say Bob Tip. Uh, Bo I'm sorry, Bob. Gimlin has finally conceded that it could have been a hoax. Yeah. And when I read that, I thought that's not that's not the Bob Gimlin that, that I know. Yeah, see, you know? this is true, Richard. They, and they, that really bothered me. Well, it did me too. See, because that's why my wife just threw a fit. She said, 
why would you let them get away with that? I said, hey, I didn't have no control over it. You see, you didn't. They had an agenda, and you didn't know it. Right. See, and, uh, and that's when she said, "There's not going to be any more interviews." That was. I, and I, I know they had an agenda because I hate to say this, because I'm British and I grew up with the BBC. Uh -huh. They lied to me too about yeah. several things. So I know if they lied to me, mainly Appleby, I know he probably lied to you. And when they quoted you saying that, I immediately was suspicious yeah. that that was taken out of context. Well, you know, had they not kept on... Uh, in fact, see, after I said that, I thought, well, you know, that isn't right, but then... Because I thought, there's no way he could have fooled me that much. Well, that. I'm going to ask you two questions now. I'm asking you this totally objectively. Uh -huh. Forget I'm your friend. Forget I'm your colleague. Number one. Within reason, within human reason, do you think there's any way that Roger, or anybody else, even without Roger's knowledge, yeah. could have gone there with a suit, walked in front of you, risked being shot, and hoaxed this? No way. There's no way. Within in, human reason. Within human reason. Who would never know? How could have he have gotten a person in there to start with? You see, that's the next thing. I've been there. It's a rough place to get to, to yeah. begin to carry a suit in there. Uh, you, could, it, you couldn't do it. And how would they get, you know, after these guys say this and that can be possible and so forth, they couldn't do it. It couldn't be done. So to this day, you're convinced Roger didn't do it. I am convinced. And no one else either. I'm convinced, yeah. Now my second question. Maybe this is my last question. Do you, do you swear on your honor that you were not in on a hoax, that you, that this really happened? You swear this on your honor? Oh, you bet. I was not in on a hoax. I would have no way of agreed to be on a hoax uh, any way, shape, or form, because I was a non-believer in the creature to start with. And for me, what, what, there would have been no advantage for me to be in on anything that was not honest. But and you never even got anything out of it. No. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean. I've heard someone say I, I, that if you'd have been in on a hoax, when Roger sort of, I hate to use the word double cross, but when he cut you out, of the picture financially, and you were pretty upset over that. If you guys had been doing a hoax, you would have exposed him. Well, definitely. Plus the fact, I told, I don't know who it was, maybe John Green, maybe he's talking personally. I said, you know, John, I would have made money off of it if I could have tried to prove that Roger did hoax it. Later on, yeah. Yeah, so you see, I could have made, I could have made money off of it if I could have said, hey, I think he did hoax that. You see, what I'm getting at here, with the Bigfoot problem, there's no in-between. It either exists or it doesn't. True. They're mutually exclusive. There's no gray area. Right. Now, if you're telling the truth, and I think you probably are, if you're telling the truth and, and the film shows what you're saying, what that means is that Bigfoot exists. That's right. And that's a very profound fact, if that's true. Well, to me it for is. For science, it. for zoology, for primatology, for society. Right. And that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, I understand. You were there, I wasn't. Yeah. yeah. So I look into your eyes and I feel, you know, if this man's telling the truth, then it, 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 it's a different world than if he isn't. That's true. Yeah. And it's, I strongly believe they exist. I have no idea how many or what part of the country other than there that they are, but I don't even know if they, you know, if they migrate or what. Yeah, I've heard so many different stories about these things that I have no idea because I've been out, actually out of it. I haven't been back. 
I've rode a lot in the mountains since then, and I've been, and I always look. You've never found tracks Never again, found tracks. But I'm always looking. I'm never on a search for them, ever. You because, imagine how lucky you were then? Well, I was lucky, plus the fact a lot of people don't realize what I went through after seeing these. And the only thing that if I ever saw another one, or ever saw another track, nobody would ever know. tell us so. I know. Nobody would <laughs> ever know. How long is it? Uh, uh, Richard, that would be selfish in my part, but if everybody that thinks that would be selfish knew what I've gone through and what my wife's gone through and what I'm still going through, they wouldn't tell a soul if they saw one. No, I, I if one that. walked right up and said howdy to me, I wouldn't ever tell a soul. Mm -hmm. You know, or if I saw beautiful tracks. How do you feel when you see on television, uh, or even that BBC thing, but since then, or in the newspaper, these comments like, oh, people have seen Bigfoot, there's a new report, ha, 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 and, and dismiss it. Uh, how does that make you feel? Well, I used to have a lot of mixed emotions about all of these things that these people tell and see and say that, well, they knew it was a guy in a suit, and they know the guy in this. I think to myself, you know, they're either trying to make a buck or they're just trying to trying to make themselves look good or bad or whatever. To me, it's making them look bad. Uh, and I think, well, there's always somebody out there trying to come up with some way to make a dollar. And it used to really burn me the way the different speeds that they'd show it on these films and different things, you know. They'd, uh, uh, somebody would call me and say, hey, Bob, that turn your television on, there's a thing on there about Bigfoot. And I'd turn it on and I'd say, I'd look at it and I'd say, well, that don't look to me like the same way it was moving or that don't look to me like, it doesn't look the thing that looked real to me. And it fiddled with it. So somebody messed with the, the speed or, or something. And as of yet, I have never seen one and I have seen a few of them that they've put on television. I've never seen one that really looked like it was uh, the real film. Well, the BBC people did a had a guy there in a costume, and they tried to replicate it. And it was a ridiculous costume. I don't know if you saw the photos. It looked so phony. I did. And they they were saying this is how it was done, and there was they, they they talked about good old boys, mysterious good old boys who were involved in the hoaxing. They yeah. never say who these good old boys are. Uh, that's what I'm wondering. It's all innuendo. And 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 just rumor that they try to create a. I was very shocked. And by then that. I've heard the story: two backwoods cowboys, yeah, lucked out in Northern California. And I think to myself, you know, these people don't even know. Uh, to call a guy a backwoods cowboy, they don't even know. They don't know what they're talking about. And uh, I I just I'm to the point now where when something comes up, I just dismiss it. It still kind of makes a little flutter in there, but I don't get mad anymore. Well, Bob, you, I, I, just I just want to tell you I appreciate you talking to us. I really do. And and you're a gentleman, and and uh, I I, I want to thank you, and um, and I want to shake your hand. Well, you're most welcome, Richard. And uh, I've been wanting to meet you for a long time. And well, we just, met. And we met. And I'm yeah. glad you called me, because... Uh, this whatever uh, I've always wanted to meet you, and, and, I, and I'm glad I'm glad we did. Well, uh, I'm not much, but I'm Bob. <laughs>